Section 37 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 5, May 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. A Curious Survival. Ella F. Mosby. The tongue of a bird, says Mrs. Olive Thorne Miller, is the tool that shows how he gets his living, as the anvil and hammer tell of the blacksmith's work, the hod of the bricklayers, and the chisel and plane of the carpenters. The tongue of the woodpecker is a barbed spear, very adhesive or sticky on its surface. We know at a glance that he uses it to capture insects hiding in the crevices of the bark, and if they are too small to be speared by its sharp point, they will stick to its gluey surface. The four-tined fork of the little nuthatch is admirable for catching grubs out of the rough tree trunk, and the slender tube of the hummingbird's tongue proves him a dainty taster of flower sweets, though he too catches insects with a click of his long sharp bill as he flies when flowers are rare. But there is a small bird whose tongue does not tell his own story. His tropical ancestry of many and many a year ago, like the hummingbird, sucked honey from flower cups and juices from fruits, and so by a very curious survival of structure this Cape May warbler, that feeds on insects now, has the tongue cleft at the tip and provided with a fringe like the iridescent and shining sunbirds the honey-creepers and flower-peckers of southern isles. Their tongues, pencils of delicate filaments, brush the drops of honeyed nectar from the deep tubes of tropic flowers and their sharp needle-like bills probe the juicy fruits, though, like hummingbirds, they add small insects to their bill of fare when necessary. This peculiarity on the part of the Cape May is the more curious because all the warblers, numerous as these are, and varying as widely as possible in character, plumage, and habits, are alike in one respect. They are insect eaters. Whether they are ground warblers, or haunt riverside and stream to explore trunk, branch, and twig-like creepers, or glean their food from the leaves, or resemble the flycatchers in habit, they live on insects, flies, ants, canker worms, caterpillars, gnats, the larvae and eggs of insects. Nothing of this sort comes amiss to them. Some warblers seek this food in the treetops and rarely descend. Others feed on the ground and build their nests there. Many frequent lower boughs and shrubs, but all seek insects as their prey. A few, it is true, like the eccentric chat and the pretty gold-crowned thrush, who is not a thrush after all, in spite of his speckled breast, are very fond of berries, but none retain the honey-sucking habits for which the tube-like and fringe tongues and keen needle-like bills were fashioned. There is also a queer coincidence between the nest-making of the Cape May warbler and that of the flower peckers in the Philippines Islands. Another curious survival. Mr. John Whitehead, the naturalist and explorer, found a most exquisite rose-colored pouch, which looked as if formed of rose petals, though it was in fact made of other material. The little honeysucker had woven it together with the silken threads of a spider's web. Now the Cape May warbler weaves his partly hanging nest of twigs and grass and lines it with horsehair in the great fir woods of the north, but he too fastens it together with spider's webbing. The Cape May is a rare warbler. Dr. Rives, in his list of Virginia birds, mentions it as a rare migrant though dr fisher says it is sometimes comparatively common in the fall 
near washington it was therefore a charming surprise when september eighteen ninety nine i found the cape mays our most common migrants at lynchburg virginia from september twentieth to october eighteenth our maple tree was rarely without them a great deal of noisy work was going on close by as the street was being widened and newly paved but these tiny scraps of valor as emerson calls his friends the chickadees showed no timidity or distrust the colors of the different birds varied widely one could hardly believe that the adult male cape may with his striking white on rich olive above and his tiger-like streaks of glossy black on shining yellow below his dark cap and chestnut red ear patches belonged to the same family as the immature female she is plain grayish olive above and has a streaked grayish breast as sober as a quaker save for her yellow rump the cape may the prairie the myrtle and the magnolia warblers are the four yellow-rumped species a most convenient mark of distinction in character our little visitor showed energy and courage usually driving off any newcomer even of his own family from his feeding ground he journeys in mixed crowds but prefers a table to himself he even won respect from english sparrows by his pugnacious traits they generally let him alone though they attacked the other strangers unmercifully he explored his tree thoroughly and with great agility often spending hours in travelling from bough to bough twig to twig up and down our maple and especially examining the underside of all the leaves within reach sometimes on tiptoe he stretched his pretty head to its farthest extent to investigate a dangling leaf above him sometimes he hung head downward to clean the eggs and larvae from a leaf below i have seen him dexterously somersault to a lower bough or hold on to a slender twig scolding and pecking alternatively as the wind tossed him to and fro occasionally he sang a little song rather thin and monotonous but not unpleasing it has been compared to the song of the nashville warbler and also to that of the black and white creeper the cause of his long stay was no doubt the abundance of insects during our warm fall swarms of gauzy winged insects were seen everywhere wheeling in airy circles in the sun and sometimes covering the wraps and hats of pedestrians there were crowds of birds in our parks one sunny afternoon i watched with interest the likeness between a wood peewee catching insects in the air and a flock of cape may warblers engaged in the same pursuit but there was a difference the warbler darted straight out from his magnolia tree caught his gnat and returned whether to the same bough i could not see for the leaves were so thick but probably only near by the true flycatcher fluttered in an aerial circle returning to precisely the same perch after capturing his insect the tiny fringed and cleft tongues seemed useless in this occupation but like some parts of the human body for which we have not yet ascertained the present use they may be invaluable as records of past history under different condition from those of today. end of section thirty seven Section thirty eight of Birds and All Nature, Volume seven, number five, May nineteen hundred, recorded for LibriVox .org by Tabarish. Look at nature. She never wearies of saying over her floral pattern noster, in the crevices of cyclopean walls, on the mounds that bury huge cities, in the dust where men lie dust also, still that sweet prayer and benediction. 
the amen of nature is always a flower autocrat the gorse is yellow on the heath the banks with speedwell flowers are gay the oaks are budding and beneath the hawthorn soon will bear the wreath the silver wreath of may charlotte smith end of section 38 this recording is in the public domain Section 39 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 5, May 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Raven. Corvus Corax. This handsome and truly interesting bird is found in nearly all portions of the globe wherever there are wide expanses of uncultivated ground. It is a solitary bird, living in the wildest places it can find, especially preferring those that are intersected with hills. In such localities it is said the raven reigns supreme, Quote, scarcely the eagle himself daring to contest the supremacy with so powerful, crafty, and strong-beaked a bird. End quote. The raven lives almost entirely on food of an animal nature, and there are few living things which it will not eat when the opportunity is given it. Worms, grubs, caterpillars, and insects of all kinds are swallowed by hundreds, though carrion is its chief diet. Its wings are large and powerful, and its daily range of flight is so extensive that many hundreds of objects pass under its ken, and it is tolerably sure in the course of the day to find at least one dead sheep or lamb. So strongly is the desire for attacking wounded or dying animals implanted in the breast of the raven, that according to Moody, the best method of attracting one of these birds within gunshot is to lie on the back on some exposed part of a hill with the gun concealed and close at hand. It is needful to remain perfectly quiet, because if there is the slightest sign of life, the raven will not approach, for, as Moody rather quaintly observes, quote, He is shy of man and of all large animals in nature, because, though glad to find others carrion, or to make carrion of them, if he can do it with impunity, he takes good care that none shall make carrion of him. End quote. It is needful to watch carefully and not to be overcome by sleep, as the first intimation of the raven's approach would to a certainty be the loss of an eye. The tongue of the raven is rather curiously formed, being broad, flat, covered with a horny kind of shield, and deeply cleft at the extremity. At the root are four rather large projections or spines, the points being directed backward. The use of the spines is not known. The cunning of the raven is proverbial, and many anecdotes are told of its intellectual powers. Charles Dickens in Barnaby Rudge has made of it an interesting character, which is by no means overdrawn. From the mass of these stories we will select one which is not generally known. Quote, one of these birds struck up a great friendship for a terrier belonging to the landlord of an inn, and carried his friendship so far as to accompany his ally in little hunting expeditions. In these affairs the two comrades used to kill an astonishing number of hares, rabbits, and other game, each taking his own share of the work. As soon as they came to a covert, the raven would station himself outside, while the dog would enter the covert and drive out the hares from their concealment, taking care to send them in the direction of the watchful bird. 
on his part the raven always posted himself close to one of the outlets and as soon as any living creature passed within reach he would pounce upon it and either destroy it at once or wait until the dog came to his assistance when by their united efforts the prey was soon killed rat hunting was a favorite sport of these strange allies and it was said by those who witnessed their proceedings that the raven was even more useful than a ferret would have been End quote. captain mcclure the arctic voyager says that the raven is the hardiest of the feathered tribe and even in the depths of winter when wine freezes within a yard of the fire the bird may be seen winging his way through the icy atmosphere and uttering his strange, rough, croaking cry as unconcernedly as if the weather were soft and warm as springtime. In captivity the raven is an exceedingly amusing, although mischievous creature, and displays a talent for the invention of mischief which is only equalled by its rapidity of execution except when placed in an enclosed yard where there is nothing that is capable of damage quote, a single raven will get through more mischief in one hour than a posse of boys in twelve and as he always seems to imagine himself engaged in the performance of some extremely exemplary duty and works his wicked will as methodically as if he had been regularly trained to the task and very well paid for it he excites no small amount of rage on the part of the aggrieved person end quote. he readily learns to speak and retains many sounds which he has once learned the raven is nowhere abundant in illinois according to mr nelson it was formerly a not uncommon resident in the northeastern portion of the state but now occurs only in winter and is rare it frequents the sand hills along the lake shore from the last of october until spring in winter they unite in small flocks and move from place to place End of section 39。section 40 of birds and all nature。volume 7 number 5 may 1900 。recorded for librivox.org by betty b。wild flowers of may。president marsh in his report to the commissioners of forest park springfield massachusetts for 1899 mentions the following wildflowers as in bloom in the park during the month of may we avoid the use of the botanical names white bloom starflower canada mayflower shepherd's purse white violet solomon's seal false solomon's seal bellwort white baneberry wild strawberry yellow bloom yellow violet common sank foil golden cup dandelion watercress pink bloom Twisted stalk, wild pink. Orange and red bloom, lousewort. Blue and purple bloom. Blue violet, forget me not, wild geranium, ground ivy. Miscellaneous. Jack in the pulpit, wild ginger, wild pink azalea, Japanese hybrids, American rosemary, Parkman's crab, flowering apple, Thunberg's barberry, ashberry, Japan ashberry, bayberry, leather leaf, American Judas Tree, Golden Chain, Japan Weeping Cherry, Seabold's Double Red Flowering Cherry, Weeping Wild Cherry, Choke Cherry, Wild Plum, Sweet Fern, Flowering Dogwood, Red Flowering Dogwood, Weeping Dogwood, Red Osier Dogwood, Siberian Red Osier, Sheep Berry, Cranberry Tree, Naked Viburnum, English Wayfarer's Tree, Common Snowball, White Thorn, Pear Leaved Thorn, english hawthorn japan quince chinese lilac flowering peach buffalo berry wild rose sweet briar rose weeping willow bridal wreath tree peony flowering almond shrub yellow root wild red raspberry 
thimbleberry or black raspberry huckleberry blueberry common high blackberry in the june number of birds and all nature we shall give the flower shrubs which bloom in that month the annual report of the commissioners of parks at springfield is a worthy example for others to follow end of section forty this recording is in the public domain section forty one of birds and all nature volume seven number five may nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by tavarish rice paper the rice paper tree one of the most interesting of the flora of china has recently been successfully experimented with in florida where it now flourishes with other subtropical and oriental species of trees and shrubs says the st louis republic when first transplanted in american soil the experimenters expressed doubts of its hardiness fearing that it would be unable to stand the winters all these fears have vanished however and it is now the universal opinion that it is as well adapted to the climate of this country as to that of the famed flowery kingdom it is a small tree growing to a height of less than fifteen feet with a trunk or stem from three to five inches in diameter its canes which vary in color according to season are large soft and downy the form somewhat resembling that noticed in those of the castor bean plant the celebrated rice paper the product of this queer tree is formed of thin slices of the pith which is taken from the body of the tree in beautiful cylinders several inches in length the chinese workmen apply the blade of a sharp straight knife to these cylinders and turning them round either by rude machinery or by hand dexterously pare the pith from circumference to centre this operation makes a roll of extra quality paper the scroll being of equal thickness throughout after a cylinder has thus been pared it is unrolled and weights are placed upon it until the surface is rendered uniformly smooth throughout its entire length it is altogether probable that if rice paper making becomes an industry in the united states these primitive modes will all be done away with end of section forty one this recording is in the public domain section forty two of birds and all nature volume seven number five may nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by tavarish good uncle to ants a kindly old english gentleman sir john lubbock baronet is no more he is not dead but has ceased to be a plain baronet as were his father grandfather and great-grandfather before him now he is a peer of the realm and he is called lord avebury the new honour lately conferred by the queen sir john probably owes to his great services in parliament for he is not only the owner of a big bank in london and a distinguished financier but also a representative in the english parliament of the university of london in both fields his work for his fellow men has been such as to merit well an honour which all englishmen are supposed to desire but we in america shall always remember him not as lord avebury but as plain sir john lubbock a man who probably knows more than any other in the world about the habits nature and instincts of insects especially of ants bees and wasps of which he has written more than one interesting book what the world needs for its happiness is more work more achievement nature which is never at rest sets a superb example not only of unceasing industry but of exquisite workmanship 
for not a beetle crawls along the ground but has a burnished back of ebony or jewelled green not a weed by the roadside goes to seed but hides its promise of next year's blossom in a pod of fairy delicacy not a spider-web glitters in the sun that is not marvellous in its structure if only the world could be more conscious of the master of all good workmen there would be less heartache than there is some little nook or sunny bower god gives to every little flower End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 5, May 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. A Floating Snail There is a small snail which is so fond of the sea that it never comes to land, and it builds such a capital boat for itself and its eggs that while large ships are sinking and steamers are unable to face the storm it tosses about in perfect safety says the philadelphia press the little snail is of a violet colour and is therefore called iantina it has a small shell and there projects from the under part of the body a long tongue-like piece of flesh this is the raft and it is built upon most scientific principles for it has compartments in it for air it is broad and the air compartments are underneath so that it cannot capsize moreover the snail knows how to stow away its cargo for the oldest eggs and those which hatch the soonest are placed in the centre and the lightest and newest on the sides of the raft the iantina fills its own air compartments by getting a globule of air underneath its head the body is then curved downward beneath the raft and the head being tilted on one side the air rushes in and fills the spaces it feeds on a beautiful little jellyfish which has a flat raft-like form with a pretty little sail upon it and they congregate in multitudes when the sea is calm sometimes specimens are washed upon the northwestern coast of france and when they are handled they give out a violet dye end of section forty three this recording is in the public domain section forty four of birds and all nature volume seven number five may nineteen hundred recorded for librivox org by tavarish egyptian trees for america here is a new kind of tree with which people in some parts of the United States will probably celebrate Arbor Day after a while. In Southern California, Arizona, and some parts of Texas, and, generally speaking, in the southwestern portion of this country, are great tracts of land without a solitary tree. The government has at last found a tree which it is believed will grow and thrive in these warm dry climates and has imported seeds and settings with which to make experiments it is called the lebek tree and is a native of egypt it grows to a large size and has a thick foliage with compound leaves like those of the honey locust the bark makes good dye stuff and the wood is fair timber one of the avenues leading to the great pyramids is lined with these trees for a distance of four miles they form a complete arch and the shade is so dense that no sun ever reaches the roadway beneath in india these trees are called the siris trees they grow wild in the forest and their trunks attain a circumference of nine feet their adaptability to the dry sections of the united states was discovered and reported upon by david g fairchild 
one of the explorers of the agricultural department at washington the lebeck tree is a deep feeder and therefore is expected to thrive on the moist subsoil found at great depths even in the american desert End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 5, May 1900.